old-fashioned murder and mayhem, The Mummified Lord, The Astonishing Story of Sidney LaSalle's, alias Lord Walter Beresford, 1859-1904. to The tinkling bell on the door of Nolan Brown Company Undertakers on Church Street in Asheville, North Carolina, alerted the clerk to the presence of a smartly dressed woman who appeared to be in her early 50s. She identified herself as Mrs. J.T. Summerfield and asked for a private conference. Once seated in the office, the gentleman was astonished to discover that she was there to claim the body of the Duke otherwise identified as Sidney LaSalle's, a notorious mummified corpse that had remained unclaimed at the establishment for six years. Welcome to another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem. I am your host, Mindy Hudson, bringing you historical tales of murder and scandal with a twist of genealogy. This month's episode, The Astonishing Story of Sidney LaSalle's, alias Lord Walter Beresford, spans several countries and could be made into a fascinating movie. Even the man's identity cannot be positively ascertained because he used so many aliases throughout his criminal career. However, the name Sidney LaSalle seems to be the one most likely to belong to him. Word of the mysterious woman who appeared at the ritzy Asheville funeral parlor on May 18, 1910, eclipsed even the current fascination that the appearance of Halley's Comet in the heavens had brought to the area. Fuel was added to the fire when curious residents questioned the proprietor of the establishment, only to be met with strict silence about the details of her identity and mission. Newspaper men were only able to ascertain she claimed to be a former sister-in-law of one of LaSalle's early wives and that his body was to be shipped to Washington, D.C. for cremation. Why she had suddenly appeared so many years after his death gave the final stroke of notoriety to an already infamous tale. Sidney LaSalle's first arrived in America in 1890 at the age of 31. Possibly born in Australia, he ended up in England and worked until his habit of gambling on horse races ended his career. Finding that his good looks, cunning, and bravado opened doors into the world of the cultured and elite, he changed his name to Lord Walter Beresford and posed as a relative of that well-established English family. He spent time in India and Burma, where he later claimed he shot and killed a Burmese servant by the name of Hassan in self-defense. Fleeing to escape the repercussions of the murder, Lascelles ended up in Algiers, where he managed to slip into the elite society. While there, he met the beautiful young heiress of an American tobacco dealer, C.H. Lilenthal, named Maud, who was on a grand European tour with her mother. Both ladies were impressed by Lord Beresford, and Mrs. Susan Lilenthal was even persuaded to lend him money on promissory notes. To her horror, she soon learned that Lord Beresford was a fraud. However, Maud had fallen under his spell. Her worst fears were confirmed when Beresford's notes were returned as worthless. Mrs. Lilenthal quickly gathered her daughter and whisked her away to Italy and then Switzerland to remove any further risk of romance between the two. Once the tour had concluded, mother and daughter returned to their exclusive posh estate, Belvoir, located along the Hudson River in Yonkers, New York. The grand vine-covered residence on North Broadway resembled a European castle. Christian H. von Lilenthal, who died in 1883, leaving behind a multi-million dollar fortune, had accumulated his riches as a tobacco distributor. His firm, Young America, was established in New York in the 1850s by his father. He married Susanna Pollock in 1853, and the couple had six children, four of whom lived to adulthood. 
Mrs. Lilenthal believed she had successfully averted the disastrous match between Maud and the conniving Lord Beresford. But she soon discovered the pair had been secretly corresponding. When she learned that he had come to America in December 1890 and planned to marry her wayward daughter, Mrs. Lilenthal immediately fled with her to the home of Mrs. McMillan, a relative in Sewickley, Pennsylvania. Lord Beresford was nothing if not persistent. He arrived in Pennsylvania at the end of January and soon tracked down where Maud was staying. The pair were able to arrange to meet in a meadow below Sand Hill at Quaker Avenue. Beresford had a carriage waiting on the road as he and Maud ran into each other's arms. Not far behind them, however, was Mrs. Lilenthal, determined to keep them apart, begging and pleading for her daughter to return with her. Love struck, the young woman refused. About that time, Beresford blocked Mrs. Lilenthal and held her while Maud ran for the carriage. Once she was seated, he let the woman go and raced to join his bride. The carriage took off at breakneck speed, leaving the poor bereft mother sobbing. They made their way to Beaver, Pennsylvania, where they secured a marriage license and were wed. Defeated, Mrs. Lilenthal returned home to Bellevue, where she immediately changed her will to exclude Maud from ever obtaining her full inheritance. The wedding took place on February 2, 1891. With his talents of persuasion, his claim of belonging to English nobility, and his marriage into an elite New York family, Sidney Lascelles was able to quickly move into the upper echelon of New York society. He even gained entry into the exclusive Manhattan and New York Yacht Club. He was a small, handsome man, standing about five feet, nine inches, with blue eyes, sandy hair, and a fashionable Van Dyke mustache. His manners were impeccable. He was a sportsman and a musician who entertained at social events with a pleasing and cultured voice. Everywhere he went, people showered him with money and privilege on nothing more than his name and the promise of reimbursement from his banks in England. He had an uncanny sense of timing his disappearance just before his creditors discovered they'd been swindled. Shortly before the marriage, Lascelles went to Rome, Georgia, where he swindled several businessmen out of money by posing as an ironworks investor and introducing himself as the nephew of Lord Charles Beresford, Vice Admiral of the British Navy. He departed Rome with cash secured by a temporary loan from the real estate agent against a check drawn from the Westminster Bank of London, which was returned stamped no funds. He also managed to convince one of the local debutantes to allow him to wear her diamond ring as a token of affection until his return visit to the area. When he returned to Rome with a new bride in hand, the jilted woman demanded her ring be returned to her. He refused until her father threatened him. Lascelles took his bride to Canada for a six-week honeymoon tour while giving time for the Georgia swindle to die down. While there, he managed to cheat the local Canadian bank out of $1,000 in bogus checks during his stay. His luck had run out in Georgia, and a warrant was issued for the theft charges. However, when he was finally located, he insisted that there had been a mistake and that he would make good on the drafts. In the interim, he and Maud set up offices and a luxurious place to live and spent money like water. The townsfolk didn't know what to make of him, so once again he was able to rack up debts of more than $10,000. Then one night, he just disappeared, leaving behind a treasure trove of clothes, furniture, and items that were put up for auction at a fraction of their worth. In the meantime, he wrote a letter to Mrs. Lilenthal, attempting to extort $2,500 from her, threatening to expose a scandalous family secret. His plan backfired, as she had him arrested on a charge of blackmail. 
Fortunately for Mrs. Lilenthal, the editor of the newspaper LaSalle's had contacted had reached out to her, and they set up a plan to capture him. Detectives communicated through advertisements to set up a meeting with the fugitive in Albany, New York, to hand over the hush money. Instead, they were able to draw him into the trap and arrest him. They chose not to pursue the blackmail charges in favor of the forgery and theft charges he faced in Georgia. Georgia Deputy Sheriff Dallas Turner traveled to New York to personally bring him back to face justice. Maud stood by him throughout the ordeal, believing that enemies jealous of their marriage were behind the allegations. LaSalle's, who had gone by several aliases at this point, was finally arrested, tried, and convicted in Georgia in September 1891 on the forgery charge. He received a sentence of 10 years in the penitentiary. At the time, Georgia loaned out convicts for labor to various industries. LaSalle's was sent to a lumber camp in Kramer, Georgia, where his silver tongue earned him enough trust that he eventually escaped. He and Maud ended up in Birmingham, Alabama in May 1892, when he learned the authorities were hot on his trail. He told Maud that he was going to leave the country and would probably never see her again. She was so distressed that she fainted, but he boarded a train and abandoned her there. He eventually was caught in America's Georgia, hiding in a brothel, that was the last straw for his long-suffering wife. She finally went back to Belvoir and filed for divorce, which was granted in 1896, about the same time as her mother's death. While incarcerated in Georgia, LaSalle's penned an autobiography entitled Lord Beresford's Book, From Wealth and Happiness to Misery in the Penitentiary, describing his exploits from early life up to the time of imprisonment. Given LaSalle's penchant for fanciful tales, it is impossible to determine which details were factual and which were fantasy. There is a surviving copy of the 300-page book stored in the Simmons University Archives in Boston, Massachusetts. Having served four years of his sentence, LaSalle's requested and was granted a pardon by Governor William Yates Atkinson. It took him no time at all to ingratiate himself into the social scene in Fitzgerald, Georgia, where he opened a small insurance brokerage. It took less than five months for his remarkable luck to kick in, and he was able to secure the largest brick building in the town, where he opened a wholesale business dealing in hay, grain, and groceries. In addition, the ex-convict managed to woo the most sought-after belle of the county, Miss Clara Pelkey, the 19-year-old daughter of a well-to-do Rhode Island family. Her father, Alexander Pelkey, was capitalist with large estates in Rhode Island, Connecticut, and had invested in several properties in Fitzgerald, Georgia. Her mother, Mary Colton Pelkey, passed away the previous year, leaving her only daughter a respectable inheritance. Much later, an article in the 1906 edition of the San Francisco Examiner quotes Clara as she describes how the romance began. Begin quote. I was organist at the Episcopal Church, and there I met Mr. LaSalle soon after his arrival. He was a natural organizer and took a hand in church matters. There was no choir at this time, so he at once organized one and sang solo himself. There were no houses in town, so Father and I boarded at the mansion house while he was preparing to build. The mansion boasted one of three pianos, and Mr. LaSalle's called frequently to rehearse the music with me on this treasured piano, end quote. Not long after he proposed marriage to her, she went on to relate how at a community picnic he promised her that if she married him, he'd take her on great adventures and she would travel with him around the world. In a series of articles published in the newspaper, Clara LaSalle's described a life of mystery and intrigue in which the promise had been kept. However, their world tour consisted of gambling, swindling, and constantly running from one country 
to another, trying to stay one step ahead of the law. The wedding took place in Fitzgerald, Georgia, with the mayor acting as best man. Just before the nuptials, a mysterious Parisian woman appeared in Fitzgerald, looking for Lascelles, wearing extraordinary clothes, French heels, and red stockings. The whole community was aghast at the sight. Lascelles introduced her as Marcel Montfort, and Clara could hardly contain herself to find this woman was one of her beau's exotic friends. When she mentioned he had proposed to her, the woman seemed taken aback. She and Lascelles had what appeared to be a heated discussion, but in the end the woman congratulated Clara on her wedding and even attended. It wasn't until much later that the bride discovered that Marcel had come to Fitzgerald to claim her lover and was shocked to discover he had become engaged to someone else. He assured her that he only planned to marry the girl to get her father's money and would leave her as soon as possible. Marcel agreed to the plan. However, when it became clear he was not going to leave the marriage, Marcel threatened to expose him. As usual, it took only a short time for LaSalle's money schemes to come to light, and just before the truth was known, he and Clara disappeared. The scandal was too much for Alexandra Pelkey. Fearing LaSalle's would have him murdered for his money, he quickly changed the beneficiary of his assets into his brother's name and made it clear that Clara was to receive nothing unless she left her criminal husband. The stress of the controversy proved fatal to Mr. Pelkey. In November 1897, he collapsed outside of the hotel on the street and died. It was attributed to heart failure, but the timing and circumstances were very suspicious. At the time, Lascelles and his wife were in Mexico City, Mexico, living in the luxurious Sands Hotel under the name Robert Turnbull of New York. LaSalle smoothly garnered entry into the exclusive jockey club where he gambled, winning and losing great sums of money. He held off the creditors and police by claiming that his wife was about to come into a large inheritance, and if they were patient, he could cover the debt. However, he didn't know at that time that his father-in-law had disinherited Clara. Lascelles caught the interest of a wealthy widow named Inez Ferrero, who offered to pay Lascelles' debts, but only if Clara would leave him. To sweeten the deal, she offered to give her an additional $10,000 to go home, but Clara flatly refused. By the time the couple left, he owed more than $20,000. Clara returned to Georgia to fight for her inheritance. It seemed she would not be successful, but her father had failed to sign one of the documents prior to his death, and she did prevail. The couple sailed to Europe, where Lascelles continued to finance their lavish lifestyle through gambling and writing fraudulent checks. Clara later described how she had been forced to dress as a young boy and pose as LaSalle's son to avoid detection. By this time, she was well aware of her husband's sketchy dealings, but was too frightened, too much in love, and too comfortable with the expensive clothes and jewels he gave her to leave him. She even tracked him down when he left her alone in a European hotel to run off with a young woman named Daisy Clifford. She found them at a resort in the Canary Islands, shocking her husband so much with her cunning and tenacity that he sent Miss Clifford packing. Having exhausted most of the prime European opportunities, the couple returned to the U.S., they ended up spending the winter in Hot Springs, Arkansas, where they stayed at the Eastman Hotel, and Lascelles frequented the pool halls, racking up great wins and losses. Owing about $14,000 in gambling debts, he convinced Mr. Lyman Hay, the proprietor of the hotel, to lend him about $1,400 until money could reach him from New York. He promptly added that money to his losses, and, knowing there was to be no rescue, fled Hot Springs, leaving Clara behind with $30 and a note that read, quote, 
poor little girl. I am awfully sorry and ashamed. But everything went wrong, and I had to vamoose. I'll send you money as soon as I dare communicate, penitently said. End quote. Lascelles was captured in January 1902 at a tavern in Boston in the company of an unidentified woman. Despite that, Clara returned to his side as he awaited trial in Arkansas. The first trial ended in a hung jury, so a new trial date was set for the next term. During that interim, he absconded again, leaving Clara with only two dollars and nowhere to find refuge for her trouble. She wrote to her former guardian, Mrs. Viola McIntosh, who was living in Chicago, asking for asylum. Fortunately, her friend agreed to help her. By this point, Clara had grown tired of the chaotic life she had been leading. She took jobs as a sales lady and a stenographer and lived quietly for the next year or so. Sidney Lascelles showed up in Chicago at Clara's door in the winter of 1903, sick and broken. Stricken with tuberculosis, he had lost much of his swagger and drive. She took him in, and he stayed with her until May 1904, when he again vanished. This time, he ended up in Norfolk, Virginia, where he posed as a cotton broker by the name of Charles H. Asquith a cousin of the former English Home Secretary and eventual Prime Minister, Lord Herbert Henry Asquith. Although his health was in deep decline, he mustered up the mysterious talent he had always possessed for making people believe whatever he told them. He hired a private physician and a nurse to accompany him to Asheville, North Carolina, a resort town known as a place of convalescence. When they stepped off the train at the Asheville Depot, heads turned to take in the stately, gray-haired gentleman dressed in his expensive finery, sporting a handsome mustache and helped along with the aid of a walking stick, he made his way to the finest local hotel. The following day, he visited the Nolan Brown Company undertakers on Church Street to arrange for his inevitable passing. He gave information to Mr. Claude B. Holder in Balmer to notify his ask with kin in England upon his demise. On November 2, 1904, the body of Mr. Asquith was delivered to the funeral parlor to be prepared for burial. As instructed, Mr. Holder embalmed the body. Dressed in his best formal suit, complete with top hat and cane, hair neatly combed and mustache waxed, the body was stored in anticipation of further instructions from England. None came. Letters were sent to the appropriate people, which came back with the puzzling assertion that Mr. Charles H. Asquith was unknown to them. The physician, the nurse, and the funeral parlor had all been duped. A five-dollar bill was the only money found in his possessions. This was given to the nurse as the only compensation she received for all her care. This development caused quite a stir in the county. Rumors swirled about the identity of the Duke, as he had been dubbed by the locals. Unable to bury the body or collect money owed for the embalming, the body was stored at the parlor, and because it eventually mummified into a remarkably well-preserved specimen, it was occasionally used as an advertisement for the skill of Mr. Holder as an embalmer. Two years passed, and the sensational article published in the San Francisco Examiner, written by the former wife of a notorious man known variously as Sidney Lascelles and Lord Walter Beresford, began to circulate. She claimed that the body in the Asheville, North Carolina, funeral parlor was that of her former husband, who was the notorious con artist who had not surfaced for the past two years. In the article, she claimed that shortly after his death, she and her companion, Mrs. McIntosh, made a trip to Asheville and saw that indeed the mummy at the Nolan Brown Company was her former husband, but lacking funds to claim him, she had said nothing and left. In 1907, 
two lawyers from Rome, Georgia, who had previously represented Lascelles, entered the building to determine if the corpse belonged to Lascelles. Both agreed it was the man they had known, but declined to pay for his burial. In the following years, several offers were made by various unsavory businessmen to buy the corpse and put it on display as a circus oddity. However, North Carolina law prohibited that, and the parlor declined. Finally, on May 18, 1910, a well-dressed woman appeared claiming that she was the former sister-in-law of Sidney Lascelles and giving strict instructions of secrecy was there to make arrangements for the body to be claimed. She was taken in to see the body, and it was clear that she recognized the man. She had papers proving her authenticity that she had received from one of his earlier wives, which seemed to settle the matter. However, neither her identity nor that of the former wife whom she represented could ever be revealed. In addition, after payment was made to satisfy whatever debts were owed to the funeral parlor, the body was to be taken on an undisclosed date by train to Washington, D.C., to the funeral establishment of C.H. Lee, where it was to be cremated. Reporters pounced on the story, trying every way possible to gain information about the mysterious woman. Who was she? Was she possibly one of the many jilted brides of the infamous Lord Beresford in disguise? She had given her name as Mrs. T.J. Summerfield of Passaic, New Jersey, but the death certificate was signed by J. Florence L. Watson of Brooklyn, Massachusetts. Try as they might, they could not get any of the principal sources to give any more information. The identity of the woman and the reason for the sudden interest in removing the body from Asheville would remain a tantalizing mystery until now. After quite a bit of digging, it was discovered that the woman calling herself Mrs. Summerfield was really the former Florence Ellswinger, who married Maud Lillendahl's younger brother, Captain Albert Lillendahl, in 1897. The failure of her marriage to Sidney Lascelles had devastated Maud. She reluctantly agreed to her divorce at the insistence of her family, but it took her years to recover from it. She reclaimed her maiden name and spent the next several years quietly living at Belvoir along with her brother, Albert, and his bride. Maud's only outside interests included attending her church and the symphony. The marriage between Albert Lilienthal and Florence also fell apart in 1902, but she and Maud maintained a friendship. Florence married a man named Charles Watson in 1904, which explains why Florence Watson was the name of the person who identified and signed the death certificate for Sidney Lascelles. She was personally familiar with him. When news of the mysterious mummified corpse residing in Asheville reached Yonkers, New York, Maud wanted to put away any trace of the man who had brought so much shame and heartache into her life. As long as he remained an object of mystery and wonder, she would never be free of his spell. So she determined to quietly put the infamy that always surrounded him to rest. Remarkably, a few years later, Maud moved to Asheville in 1926 at the age of 60. She married a noted musician named Carl Bear, a charter member of the Boston Symphony. They had a modest but spacious home at 45 Melrose Avenue in Asheville. She spent the remainder of her life happily hosting musical events and working with charitable organizations such as orphanages and children's presentations. She passed away in 1931 at the age of 65, a much loved and respected member of the community. As for Clara Lascelles, after leaving Asheville without the body of her beloved Sydney, she fell into depression and lost so much weight that Mrs. McIntosh took her back to Fitzgerald, Georgia, where she expected to die. 
To her surprise, her health returned, and she lived in relative peace, except that rumors spread that Lascelles wasn't dead at all, but was hiding in the house. Curiosity seekers and police began watching the residents for signs of the wayward fugitive, and the stress became too much for her. At the end of the newspaper article, Clara declared, quote, we are selling the house and the chickens and most of the furniture. Before this is published, we shall be hidden away in Mexico, not Mexico City, but a smaller town where nobody knows us and where under new names I hope nobody ever will. There I hope to live what once I would have called a stupid, uneventful existence." End quote. She was apparently successful in that endeavor, as there is no further trace of her. In the end, the man known as Sidney Lascelles, Lord Walter Beresford, and a host of other names was perhaps the most prolific con artist of all time. His gift of charisma and cunning opened doors to the most elite people and places all over the world. He left a trail of broken-hearted women willing to throw away everything to be with him wherever he went. There are some estimates that he conned as many as 16 women into matrimony. Despite never having money of his own, he managed to stay in the most exclusive hotels and resorts, dine at the best restaurants, wear the best clothes and jewelry, and obtain millions of dollars throughout his criminal career. When he died, his corpse was so well preserved that it became an object of curiosity and awe. And to this day, no one knows who he really was. Thank you for listening to the story of the mummified Lord, the astonishing story of Sidney LaSalle's alias Lord Walter Beresford. Information about resources used in piecing this story together may be found in the description box. Please remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share. Beginning this month, Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem is also offering memberships for those who would like more information about the stories covered in the podcast. If you're interested in seeing the articles and documents used to put the stories together, as well as behind-the-scenes photos and information, consider becoming an assistant sleuth or a genealogy sleuth. Your membership will help me be able to continue digging up these unusual true crime stories. And join us again next month for another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem.